Another question I do have real quick. NPS 0821, is that new patrol ship? What does the NPS stand for? So in the uh, BISIG verse, I guess is what we're calling it. Yes. <laughs> um, the ship registrations reflect more a real world naval designation system, where in okay. uh, the canon universe, you have NCC. And I don't know if anybody even really knows what NCC actually stands for. It's either naval construction contract or uh, navigational contact code. So, you know, I always thought, well, I see the CC and my military brains. Well, CC is cruiser. So, um, yeah. you know, so when I make non cruiser ships, what's what's their designation? So it's a patrol ship. So and so it's naval patrol ship. You know, eight hundred twenty-one. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. So you know, you would only see NCC on an actual cruise. You know, a destroyer would have like NDD or NDG on it. Um, a, a battleship NBS there. That's funny because in Starfleet battles, it's the same thing. Like the 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 frigates and stuff have FG designations for the SSDs. So that's interesting, actually, that you tie in like that. And I want to uh, and I want to talk about the briefly just to swap tracks. You know, I obviously point out during the script of off, off book about the, the the sheer numbers of these things. You know, in the NX era, you get a sense that there's a couple of dozen ships of any kind. It, it, you know, the NX being the best, and the NXs are built slowly. And this is not many years after. Uh, by by having so many hundreds and hundreds of a single class, what was the thought process in in going from being what would be a very small fleet to an, a ginormous fleet, possibly bigger than TNG had potentially? There's actually, this is something I've thought about a lot. I know that might come as a shock to you. Just kidding. I overthink everything. Um, you do. There's, 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 <laughs> three, there's three major components to that. Um, the first one is a little bit of revisionist history, um, where we're based off of Star Trek Enterprise, but there's going to be times where some things happened in that show that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. And, you know, this is all for fun, right? So, you know, I've already mm -hmm. established we're not canon. So it's okay to do a little bit of revision as long as we write it down somewhere later. Mm -hmm. The second thing is looking at World War II um, and looking, and I've actually did, uh, a, I made an Excel spreadsheet where I actually did the math of how many ships the United States mm -hmm. built during the war. And I just looked percentagely at what we did. And percentagely, what I'm talking about here is really not that far off the mark from what the United States was doing. Um, and then on top of that, you add in two two critical factors. You add in modern technology of the 2150s, which is going to be you know 10 million times more advanced than what was you had in World War II, because a lot of these construction elements here are probably automated, right? At this point, where you have computers doing it. And then secondly, it's not just the United States; it's the entire planet Earth and all of the human colonies, and they're getting help from their allies, uh, you know, from at least four other major worlds. So, you know, if, if it, you, really you, you'd be throwing like 8 billion people into the, hey, we have to get this done category. And, you know, you'd have manufacturing facilities all, all over the place making stuff like this would have been humanity's mission for a few years is to build a military. Because as you correctly pointed out, there really wasn't one, not of substantial quality or purpose before the war started you know, with my my real world understanding of you know the military and other science fiction stuff that takes a bit a little bit more of a realistic approach to sci-fi than maybe star trek does or something you know the you the number of ships and people you would need to maintain an organization that is truly the size of the federation that's even at this time period which is still spans tens of light years in every which direction you, you would need so far more to to do what starfleet does than what is really honestly mentioned or seen on screen and in my opinion the, a re, a more real world federation i think would have a substantially larger starfleet than kind of what we see in existing canon so I'd take it kind of if we're extrapolating your universe further to TNG rather than the sort of may maybe tens of thousands of ships, you're looking at several hundred thousand ships, if not maybe a million ships in, in Starfleet, which would also mean a million or two million Dominion ships. Like you're looking at the war being infinitely grander than we've ever seen. Millions of vessels and I guess multi-billions of crews. Because if, if you're already t thousands now, then obviously it's going to be millions of ships then, surely. Yeah, and event, and also what plays into that, which we talked about in the first part of the episode, is you know Star Trek is a TV show filmed by humans on Earth. So ninety nine percent of the crew members on all the ships are humans, right? In in my world, we're free of that tether, and you know you would have just as many 
Andorians and any other creature in the Federation as you would humans, right? And one of the things that I try to constantly allude to is the fact that, like, you know, it, it doesn't look like it does on the TV shows where it's all, like, you have one or two aliens on the ship and everybody else is human. Like, you know, it, it would be a very, very close percentage match per ship, and that's by design in this universe. Let's pretend that this isn't the Federation. Let's pretend this is Europe, and all of the nations of Europe are forming one giant military together. Um, don't you think France would want just as many soldiers in, in this army as England would, especially in like leadership positions? Like They would want everything to be as equally percentagely divided as possible. So it's kind of a quota system. We've got to have like mandatory Andorian from their military to Federation, it's mandatory. You must have a certain percentage serving. They don't get a choice. I mean, that's kind of forceful. So I guess it's the military, but it isn't the military. Well, that's what I was going to ask, because yours is setting up a very militaristic Starfleet, which with the Kinzinti conflict and the Romulan War, I can understand them pumping out the ships, getting that structure, which I kind of like, because eventually, I assume, in the best of verse, we're going to get some explorers and stuff that now that the, the conflicts have died down, we move towards that more because I it's always been the debate whether Starfleet's militaristic or not. And it clearly is. It's, it's regimented that way. But then their philosophy is to explore. And then it goes in waves as far as how the conflicts change things. It's the only organization of it. You know, there's there, there's then there's the trade guys. So obviously in comparison to the military side, because they put all their eggs into the basket. Just real quick to touch back on the whole forceful conscription. So there's no drafts per se, like, it, you know, the, the current United States military, you know, is, is fairly large. It's 1.9 or 2.1 million people in the in all combined services, right? And none of the people who are in it were currently drafted, right? So the way I would look at it is they would go to their recruiters and say, hey, this is the quota you have to hit. And if you look online and you can read about it, like real world United States military recruiters have quotas that they're supposed to hit. They're, they're directed like, hey, you have to recruit X number of people. And these Federation recruiters would have that exact same mandate, but you know they would be doing things to incentivize people to want to join it. So you, it wouldn't so much be as a as a we're forcing you to do this. It's like yeah, we have limits we have to hit to fill all these ships and everything, but we we can make this look really appealing in advertising. And it also kind of sounds like because of these you know war and then another war that it, it's semi conscription, but also that. Everyone who's joining is joining specifically to be a combat operator. There is no exploration at this point. So everyone, for a good 30 years of Starfleet, everyone is a soldier. Because no one's joining to explore. You can't explore. There is none of that. So you're looking at a full generation of Starfleet is... Because, you know, join Starfleet to fight the Kazinti. In, in your universe, it's purely military. And then, obviously, those guys get older, they become the admirals. I mean, Starfleet's probably going to be, a in your verse, military until well into late TMP. As generations, I mean, obviously, it takes years and years change mentality but you know you can imagine all the admirals are like well are these kids are exploring what's wrong with them you know so it's a much darker universe where military is the is the focus that's, and that's why the the admirals are all assholes because they got that old mindset and they want to steer things that way so it is most definitely military front focused not exploration focused because you know in my universe the romulan war wasn't like a thing with 10 ships that happened. It was like this massive quadrant spanning battle that almost eradicated like the main powers of the alpha quadrant. Right. So, uh, and you know, and it comes back to the whole canon balance of what, what do I want to do with versus canon? Right. And you'll see that reflected in the ship designs too. Um, the ships that you, we've looked at so far have been post Romulan warships. Well, now, the full beam cloak detection thing was interesting because when I was writing the script, your notes said sonar. And I'm like, ooh, Discovery made that mistake. No sonar in space, dude. So it would use yeah. the, the deflection grid or the whatever to detect ships. Like, I'm trying to figure out how that would work. So, so the way it works is at this point, especially after fighting the Romulans, the Federation has kind of gotten the method that tachyon versus cloak means maybe we can kind of see where the cloak ship is or where it has been and kind of follow a trail of it. Cause throughout okay. Star Trek history, you see different iterations of this whole, well, let's do tachyon X, Y, Z thing to locate cloak ship. Um, 
And um, I think one of the more famous examples is when you have the TNG episode where the Klingon Civil War is happening and Data runs the Nebula class with all the ships spread and they're yep. shooting tachyon beams to each other. And uh, yes. I think that they also say the neutral zone has a tachyon detection grid along yep. it. So this is kind of like an earlier version of that. And um, mm -hmm. one of the things I think we'll see, not just in my universe, but already exists in Trek is kind of like this cloak versus detection battle that keeps happening like this. It's really, it's obviously not one thing. Like if you look at undiscovered country, right? It was a big deal when they had a cloak ship that could also fire while cloak, that would just be yeah. one thing up in, in this level. So, um, and you know, also in my universe, we've previously encountered the Sulaban. This whole cloaking thing is nothing new to them. Well, so maybe they can't see the cloak, but if they deploy this, this, uh, system that's on the ship here, and maybe mm. it's like you have your big fleet bubble here and then it's like a cube, right? And then on each one of the corners, you have a ship with this thing on, it will see if a cloaked vessel is trying to like penetrate in within that bubble that they're making. So then you'll know right away, like, oh my God, there's a cloaked ship around us somewhere. Or at least an older cloaked ship, because I'm sure they would then have the newer versions would be completely oblivious because that's the point. They're trying to always one up. Yep, mm -hmm. and that's part of the problem. So it's their kind, and that's very reminiscent of real world military systems. With like, look at the American Joint Strike Fighter and F twenty two stealth aircraft, and what the Russians are building, like their S three hundred, S four hundred missile uh, SAM battery systems, which are saying, "Oh, we can see your stealth now," and it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's the same thing. There's um, a lot of design elements that I look to my Discovery class ship that I invented for that that I wanted to. Uh, make sure we got in. So, you know, your favorite weapon system is in there all over the place is CMZ seven that you guys were so thrilled with <laughs> on, the, on the discovery class ship. Hopefully like the design, hopefully you guys can look at the picture and point to be like, Oh yeah, I know exactly where that is because like the way it's set up is like exactly the same on this ship as it was with the uh, discovery class um, that I made. And same thing with stuff like, you know, the shield generators, the transporter equipment, the anti-gravity stuff. Cause in, in the Bissig verse, the ships can't just fly into the atmosphere. They have to have some kind of mechanism to support them once they go in the atmosphere or else they'd fall out of the sky like a rock. Mm -hmm. um, you, they can't, I mean, in theory, you could just put your thrusters on full and, hold, and hover yourself there, but in short order, you'd run out of thruster fuel and <laughs> you'd fall out of the sky or, or whatever. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Another thing I forgot to mention was those blue balls you see on the sides mm -hmm. of it. Those are the beefed up inertial dampeners. And that's a design that you're going to see in further ships and other ships that I've made, but they're not going to be as beefed up as that. So th th so this ship has inertial dampeners that are like way more heavily beefed up to work with this tachyon detection system. See here, like the pointy bits on the on the backside on top of the impulse engines. Mm -hmm. Those are actually like the communication uh, systems for subspace communication these ships would be patrolling the neutral zone and they needed a way to stay in constant contact via subspace. And if that yes. connection was broken, uh, Starfleet would know something went wrong and they would send a uh, reserve ships from a central location to that point. So those, those four um, spiky bits you see on the impulse there, that that's the continuous subspace communication relay systems built nice. into the ship. Uh, no, I mean, the bridge is kind of exactly where you think that it should be when you look at the design there. It's just not, prominently screaming oh i'm a bridge in your face there'll yeah. be other ships that we have though that do do that again that's part of that whole yeah. balance of real versus you know not real trek so we have some kind of i need to hold on to something thing and i put in artwork for the patch end of the mm -hmm. character it's named after the um the guy it's named after dennis shanahan he was actually my commanding officer when i was in the 77th um yeah. uh and yeah so he was a real world army captain who we turned into a starfleet captain uh, cool. and i had my artist i gave her a picture of him so she actually drew him for it and the 77th patch in the real world army is the statue of liberty on a trapezoid essentially so that's why the fleet patch for it has uh the statue of liberty on it and um the real world army organization saying is uh liberty warriors so that's yes. why i put that on there so that's what that's in reference to on the patch um and obviously they would be wearing the newer uniforms but shanahan served during the earth Romulan war so he has the yeah. ent yeah. um stuff and he has his, and if you notice on his patches is actually a Poseidon class ship with the word Olympia. All right. Well, um, I think we'll call that 
a wrap for this episode. Um, this has been a fantastic delve into your universe, and we're looking forward to more. We're going to have quite a few episodes based in this universe to flesh it out, get a whole history, and get a whole, like we said, the Bessic verse will come to life, guys. So make sure you watch them all. So thank you, David, for joining us. And uh, like I said, he'll be back. Go check out the, the Discovery Class one if you haven't already, and stay tuned for others as well. So, And the best way to stay tuned, subscribe. Hit subscribe. Hit the like button if you like this video, and uh, also click the notification bell icon to all so you don't miss any of these. And if you have a comment, please put it down below for David. I'm sure he'll be checking them out and be answering any questions you have about the ship in the comment section as well. So, And, and David, pimp out our, our Super Chat lives. You can, you can do that bit. Oh, and guys, another great way to support the channel is super chatting. If uh, if you super chat, they have to read it out so you can steer the discussion. You can say something kind of crazy. You can say something really smart, whatever makes you happy. So you should totally <laughs> do it because it's good to engage. And that's engage. cool. Engage. Yes, like engage. <laughs> you see, Stuart, as a commander, I finally get someone I can now order around and do my work for yeah. you. Yeah. You finally created the correct good. <laughs> you finally got that, Stuart. So we need another, another host for the dynamic. All right, cool. Okay. Yeah. Ensigns, ensigns galore. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. So until next time, I'm Captain Foley. I'm Quanagongs. I'm David Bissig. See you time. later, guys. <laughs>